full of life, enjoyment, and it all depends upon your inter interpretation of what you're going through. So when the trials come, the Bible says, just dance for joy. Amen. <laughs> I'm glad to have my wife with me again. I'd like for her to at least greet you today. I appreciate yeah, so much. Yeah. The lady that has shared very, very much with the ministry that God has allowed us to evolve. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God is so good. Oh, oh, God. God. Amen. And his oh. presence is so real here this Man. morning. Oh, kind of feel selfish, you know, like. Lord, it's, it's just us, your children, and you're just being so good to us this morning. But that's what he likes to do. Amen, amen, and I have amen. enjoyed serving him from my childhood since I was seven. And you know, look, those of you here that can attest to it, he's never failed us. No, and I praise God for the privilege of being able to work alongside over 51 years with my husband, 52 52 years with my husband, um, pastoring, evangelizing, uh, preaching, children's ministry, all the different uh, doors that he's opened up for me as a woman to be able to serve him. And I praise God because he uses each and every one of us. We feel unworthy, but he says you're worthy because of my blood and yes, I've made yes, you worthy. Amen. He's wonderful. Yes, you he guys is. are wonderful. I love Amen. each and every one. Thank oh, you for the time to get to be back here. I don't know when we'll ever be back again. A few times now that mom's gone. But I have a brother and sister in law that need the Lord to pray. <laughs> and um, so once in a while we'll get to visit. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, sweetheart. I appreciate it very much. If you could uh, maybe uh, cut out some of the bass tones and raise the gain just a touch, may stop some of the popping noises that we're getting here. I guess working in radio for too many years has made me a little more sensitive to sound than I ought to be. <laughs> All right. I'm glad that you are not a people that are really stuck on time. Yeah. I was in a church in Texas and the pastor warned me before service we were raising funds for our work in missions. And he said, now, you have to give me this service back before 12 o'clock. So my people leave at 12. And if I don't get it back in enough time, you're not going to get an offering. <laughs> well, I needed an offering. I needed their help. And so they had special songs. They had baby dedication. And five minutes to 12, he handed me the service. And two minutes to 12, he got it back. Because I needed to do the work. <laughs> Anyway, I'm delighted to be here, and I will do my best to utilize the time as quickly as I can to share what I believe may be a help to you. Amen. Preaching is not just being able to talk about something, but to make your life a little bit better. Right. You have 45 minutes. I have 45 minutes. <laughs> <minutes. laughs> <laughs> All right. That means, that means five. Uh -huh. Anyway. I'm going to read this morning Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 19. It says, he pressed them. And how about you? Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Mm -hmm. Jesus came back. God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of books or from teachers. My Father in heaven, God himself. Let you in on this secret of who I really am. And now I'm going to tell you who you are. Really are. You are Peter, a rock. This is a rock on which I will put together my church. A church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. But that's not all. You will have complete and free access to God's kingdom. Keys to open any and every door. No more barriers between heaven and earth, earth and heaven. All right. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven. A no on earth is a no in heaven. Right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word. And I'm so grateful that you give us opportunity to know you. To be able to find you in such a personal way. For God to each one of us, you're our Lord. 
and our minister. We give praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. There are two, or there is a, a decision that every single one of us have to make. Being a believer in Jesus Christ is a whole lot more than just being raised in a Christian atmosphere. It has to come down to a decision. Is he really who he says he is? Then, if he is, why not trust him? This is where it comes down to. The enemy wants to spin you around like a top. He wants to do everything he possibly can to keep you guessing, to keep you doubting, to keep you without the strength that is necessary to accomplish what God intended you for. Right. You are not an accident. You are not here by chance. God saw you from before the foundation of the world. He right. placed in you talents and abilities that he wants to use for the kingdom. And whether or not we allow him to do it is whether or not we accomplish the plan that God has. So one of the most important things you will do in life is to Make that decision. Is he really? It's not what people are telling you. It's not what is you learned in Sunday school. It's not because you have read the right kind of books. It's not because you have been brainwashed into a philosophy or an idea. But that you have really come to the decision. Who is he? Right. This is what Jesus was asking his disciples. Come on, guys. Come on. Right. Who am I? Really? And this is what I want today to be able to assert for my own life. He is my everything. Yes, he is. It doesn't matter what the situation is or the circumstance. Now, the, the second thing that I noticed there was quite of interest in Jesus. And I'm going to tell you who you are. All right now. Wouldn't it be interesting to have Jesus tell you who you are? Man. What you really are? I mean, just... Really, this is what the scripture is talking about. He said, who you are. And one thing that I like about this, and if you'll allow me to use the vernacular of the younger generation, when Jesus replied, he said, Peter, you rock. <laughs> you rock my world. All right. He said, you didn't get this, except for a divine revelation from God himself. One of the most important things is to really understand and be able to know that by revelation of the Holy Spirit that we come to that understanding of who Jesus Christ really is. Amen. Yeah. A lot of times we spend a lot of money even going to seminars. We go to Bible schools, Bible studies. We do all kinds of things and never really get to the place to where we know him as our everything in life. Jesus said, I am going to build my church. Yes, yes. Now, Jesus said he's going to do it. I can assure you he's going to do it. Amen. You're his church. Seriously. I mean, we, we often think, well, it's all the conglomerate that's the big, <coughs> massive part of our world, and that's true. But you also are to God the embodiment of everything that he expects and anticipates the church to be. Amen. And so when we understand that I must be an absolute perfect, no, 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 wait a minute, but a perfect replica of the church. All right. You say, well, now, I've got my faults and I've got my mistakes. It's kind of like when when um, Noah and Mrs. Noah were in the ark. All right now. You know, they, I can imagine some mornings Mrs. Noah went crying to her husband. He said, the giraffes are in with the elephants. And the elephants are in with the pigs and the chickens. And this thing is just a mess. All right now. And I can imagine old brother Noah hugging his wife. He said, honey, I know it's not perfect, but it's the best thing there is afloat. 
I want you to know that it may not be perfect, but it is the best thing in this entire world, this thing called the church. Long, 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 long time ago. And I don't know how to explain eternity because I have a mind that is very extremely limited. I did well to get out of kindergarten. So you know, there's a lot of things up here that I don't understand. But I want you to know that, that back before Adam and Eve, there was a world. There was a universe or universes, whoever your thoughts and thinking are, might be. But there was one of the God's created beings that kind of thought he was fairly important. And so he decided to get a Facebook page. Right. And get a Twitter account and right. have the latest cell phone. Right. All right. of the bells and whistles. And he had this long, long, massive list of millions of names. So he could send out multiple texts all at one time. All right. Oh, yeah. And he got around to the place where he began to kind of weave his way in. You know. God is, is God's good, but. Now, I'm going to stop for just a moment and, and share with you something that is important to you. Any time you criticize authority, you are in trouble. <laughs> I don't care if he's the president of the United States or he's the neighbor next door. Criticism is one thing that caused all of this to begin to take place. But when we criticize, we feel that we are more important, we are bigger than anything else that is happening. And Satan began, and finally he convinced one-third of the angelic host that he would be a better God than God was. Right now. Now, I'm going to let Pastor clear, clarify all of this. I'm going to just, you know, do it and you straighten them out later about the theology of it and, and everything about some of this. So, but anyway, they went to war against the throne of God. One third of the angels agreed that Satan would be a better God. They went to war. God stopped them. Amen. And we know that the war was war ended. But I still. And then God placed the, the angels in chains. But, but God is always fair. Yes. I don't know if you've ever been called to the principal's office when you were in school. Uh, yeah, you were, I can tell. Uh, but God called Satan to his throne. He said, I'm going to do something that you're not going to understand. You're not going to believe. He said, I'm going to make another creation. They're not going to have power. They're not going to have authority. They're not going to be able to do what you angelic hosts can do. Right now. They're going to be weak. Mm -hmm. But I am going to give them something that is bigger than anything you have ever imagined. All right now. But I'm going to give them the ability to believe in me. Amen. And by faith, they will destroy you. Amen. This is what it's all about, is that coming to that place of a realization that though we are weak, though we have limited abilities, the power of an almighty God operating inside of us takes priority and authority over every force that the devil could ever want to bring against you. Amen. You understand when Jesus said, let the gates of hell uh, or the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. In the Old Testament time, the gate was the place of importance. It was where town hall was. It was where the magistrate courts were. It was where uh, the Senate met. It was where all of these kinds of things. And, and the Bible says that, that anybody who was allowed to sit at the gate was an important individual. All right, all right. So what he's saying is let Satan call the most diabolical scheming demons to 
the gate, the meeting place, All right, now. the place of their authority. Let them call them up and let, let the demon of fear and doubt and sickness and worry and, and anger and frustration and unhappiness and depression and everything you can name out there, let those demonic spirits come and tell Satan and they get together and we're going to figure out how we're going to take church down. Right now. Uh -oh. yeah. All right. We can destroy the church. We can we can destroy it. All we have to do is get them bickering, get them Man. depressed, get them Man. afraid, get them sick, all kinds of things. And so they all scatter throughout all the world and they do everything they can to stop you. Man. The church. Okay? I, I think you're following along with me. Like I say, pastor's going to clarify all of this later, and you'll understand it more perfectly. But for me right now, I just want to challenge you, if I possibly can, God does the impossible. Yeah, yeah. 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 1971, my wife and I felt that God had called us to leave the United States and to begin ministry in a different part of our world. So we went to... Uh, anyway, uh, but anyway, the, the, uh, uh, we went to our, our national office in Springfield, Missouri, and there we submitted, well, had submitted our, our resume, our request, and we met with them, and they gave us all kinds of tests, physical tests, mental tests. Abilities, you know, everything they could think of. And, and one of them was language aptitude. All right. Because they wanted to make sure we could learn foreign language. But about two or three days after taking that test, <laughs> the director of missionary personnel met me and my wife in the hallway. And he was a big, tall guy. And he put his arms around us. And he looked at my wife and he said, you know, you did a great job on that language aptitude test. All right. Then he looked at me. He said, have you ever thought about working in an English-speaking country? Seriously, I mean, I'm serious. The words still ring in my brain. Delmer Gwines did it. And I said, no, why? We feel like God's called us Latin America. He said, well, in all the years that we have ever given this test, no one has ever flunked it more miserably than you have. <laughs> we don't feel you can learn a foreign language. Oh. Well, oh. tell a stubborn, hard-headed German he can't. <laughs> <laughs> we felt God had called us. But I, must, I want to assure you that uh, after we'd only been there for a few weeks, I discovered that Delmer Gwines was right and God was wrong. All right, now. He had called his first mistake. <laughs> all right, all right. There was no way the teacher would grab me by the jaw and shake it and say, you America. I know what she said now, but I didn't know then. I had the slightest idea. I knew what horse was. I knew how to count to 10. And I knew what a taco was and all this kind of stuff, you know. But Spanish, no. <laughs> She would grab my jaw and shake and say, you Americans have too stiff of a jaw. You've got to learn to limber it up to be able to speak Spanish. And they made me go home and lay my head on the bed with my head off the side of the bed and, and make the sound like this. <laughs> in order to roll the R. You know how in Spanish they've got that roll of the, of the R in there. I found out that the left side of my tongue vibrates and the right side looks at it and says, what is going on? <laughs> I mean, it was, just, it was just a tough time, and I, I could not, I could not. I wanted to go home. I was on the radio every day before we left. When we were pastoring a church in the United States to qualify for going, we were live on Sunday, every other Sunday, in broadcasting our services, and, and, and I couldn't even order food in a restaurant. All right. Well, I could because I knew what menu, you know, the letters are all the right way up and down. I did learn that much in kindergarten. Uh, how, how letters are supposed to look. But, but you know, I, I would just, just point. I found out that octopus in its own ink is, is not bad. You know, you can eat it. It's pretty good. 
you know, this kind of stuff that, you know, you can't, you can't, it's not going to work. But when God calls you, and I, I share this with you because I, I feel like it might help, He does it all the time. I remember the day, I remember exactly what I was doing when the Holy Spirit brought a divine revelation to a hard-headed German. And he said to me, this is how and why Spanish works. And folks, I mean this sincerely. God was the one who did it. I was privileged to graduate number one. Therefore, demolishing that entire massively corrupt culture. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God. This next one is tough for me. Fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience into maturity. God always shows up on time. He never misses. One of my responsibilities when we finally arrived to, uh, to Nicaragua was after the earthquake, I was given a water-soaked box of books and Bibles and song books and said, you're now in charge of literature in Nicaragua. I didn't want to. I thought it was beneath me. <laughs> Somehow the Holy Spirit even works with my vanity. All right. I mean, I didn't come here to sell books. I came here to preach. But yet somehow the Holy Spirit got into my heart and began to make it happen, make it happen. And I finally decided it was time for the jungle churches to also have books. So I borrowed three mules. I saddled up our, our mule. Um, she was a white mule. We called her Lightning because she had a real kick to her. You know, like white lightning. Okay, but anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, I, I, I loaded each mule down with 250 pounds of books and Bibles and headed out to, to the jungle. Found our churches. And, oh, it was just amazing. I mean, you lay know, all that beautiful color out there. People who haven't even seen a book in their life. Right. What goes on? We had one lady who paid me with a 1910 dime that she got off of one of the Marines that went into Nicaragua in the early 1900s wow. uh, under William Walker. I take anything, just, just want you to have the material. All right. and I'm sharing this with you because what happened is I, I got sick. <laughs> I mean, really sick. I tried to go home on my mule. I hurt like everything. I mean, I hurt. It was, every step was pain. My fever was high. I sang at the top of my lungs to try to stop the pain. When I could no longer ride, I would get off, walk, crawl, do whatever, get back on. Finally, the mule got me back home. My wife called the doctor. The doctor came to the house, and he said, there's no hope. There's no hope. All right, all right. He's going to die. Keep him here. Our hospital is not as nice as your home. And we lived in a um, house made of bamboo and mud. All right, now. Part of it fell in while we lived there. The part we weren't using. The part we used, I wouldn't let it fall down. But anyway, <laughs> he said it's better than our hospital. Let's give him liquids if he can tolerate them. In the morning, I will come back and prepare his body for shipping to the United States. They don't embalm there, and so it had to be a different kind of process. Within 24 hours, bodies are, are buried in most of Latin America. But anyway, you know, God wasn't at all shocked or surprised. Didn't just suddenly occur to him you know, that something ought to be done. 
God woke up one of the pastors who lived out in the jungle. He knew since my trip who I was and where we lived in the mountains of Nicaragua and Matagalpa. He saddled up his mule and he rode in. He got there a little while after the doctor had gone. Knocked on the door, my wife met him, and he explained that he needed some books and Bibles. Now, this guy was uneducated. He couldn't read or write. He right. had a lady in his church who could, and she would read it to him and, and help him, and, and then he would preach, and boy, he could preach. He really could. He was a very, what we call, uneducated, simple kind of guy. But he stood there at that door and explained what he wanted. My wife said, my husband is very sick. So... I'm going to open the room where we have all of the books and Bibles and everything stored. You figure out what you want and, and, and let me know and we'll settle up the accounts later. I cannot leave my husband's side. I guess that he finally got what he wanted. I don't even remember now whether or not he got, he got the stuff or not. But anyway, he said, well, you reckon it'd be all right if I prayed? All right now. All right, all right. And I, I don't know whether it was the Holy Spirit or the smell of being a writer when he walked into my room. Now he smelled like his mule all the time. All right. He lived in a very rustic house made out of thatch, dirt floor, and he had the biggest old sow, that's a mama hog, uh, that lived right inside the front door. I mean, when you walked in, you had to step over her. And she had unkind words always to say. When you did that. She did not like being disturbed. Now I'm going to tell you something. You don't want to ever be bitten by a hog. They can take your foot off. They can. They are, have power in those jaws. There was Lino Rayo. He was rolling up his straw hat. I can still see him. And it was just weird how, you know, these flashes somehow out of that stupor that I was in. And he was rolling up an old straw hat that had been through at least a thousand tropical storms. And, right and everything. He was, he was nervous. We had electric lights. and We had cement floors. And. We had glass in the windows, and you know, it was just, it was, he was out of his element. But he wasn't out of his element when he began to talk to God. All right, right now, all right, all right. And I don't know, at that moment I could not understand. I thought that someone had taken one of these real intensely bright lights and was shining into my eyes. And so I closed my eyes against the pain of that and only discovered that the the brightness, the light was stronger inside than it was outside. All right. The next morning when the doctor came, I was already up working with other responsibilities. I could see it on the couch doing some book work. <laughs> you should have seen the surprise <laughs> on his face. Nobody but God. You don't even have a fever, do you? You didn't even have to touch me. You see, God... He Amen. is going to build his church. He is going to build his church. Went through a lot of war, Nick and I will. A lot of war. Seven years that we were there was war. Last year really bad. The Nagu was taken, the airport closed. On numerous occasions, it was just a rough time. It's best I forget as much as I can about it. But one thing that my wife and I, we just felt like God was telling us we needed to get another church built. All right. We'd normally go in, find a vacant lot somewhere in an area that didn't have a church, find out if we could buy it. Thank you for supporting missionaries. We could buy properties and build buildings. And some of you could go down there and do it yourself. I know this church has been really active in Peru and other places, but <coughs> I mean, you get in and you get involved. There's nothing that lifts the heart of a missionary more than suddenly seeing these bright-eyed Americans, enthusiastic, getting off the plane. <laughs> wow. I mean, you're getting weighed a bit all, and then suddenly here they come, all energized, enthused, and excited, and it just makes it go on. So anyway, we'd find whatever law we could. We would try to buy it. We would just put up some sound system and go to preaching right. every night, night after night after night after night after night. We'd vary from anywhere from two to three to four months to bring a congregation together, have a national pastor that was going to be taking over. It wasn't one of those just jump in and do it and 
and I would train and talk and work with them until they were ready. Men called of God, men and women, wow, it's an exciting time, but we felt we needed one more, one more. So we found a very large lot this time. It was unoccupied. I don't think we ever found out who the owner was. But anyway, it was just vacant area right beside a shell gas station, approximately two acres of land. All right. We never had anything like that. Most of our small lots, places here and there. But I said, okay, let's give it a try. We, we talked to the shell gas station and talked them into allowing us to plug into their electric uh, system so we could have lights. We strung up lights around a perimeter of rusty boards put on posts out there to bulbs hanging and, and built a platform and started preaching. Right night after night after night. We were there for one year just preaching night after night. Bullets would fly. People would get nervous sometimes, especially my wife. We left our kids at home some most of the time because the shooting was horrific. And you could tell where in, in the city that uh, the fighting was the worst. And when they get close to where we live, it was hard for her to be up there playing the accordion. But, but she did. And uh, God was so gracious. He takes care of them. Yes, you will. Yes, you I, I want to tell you this. Everybody told us, don't do it. Don't do it. It's too dangerous. All the missionaries moved out of the country. We stayed. We felt God called us there. They went to Costa Rica and other places, like back to the United States. It was a difficult time. Three children, well actually the last three months of, of that, we had the fourth one. We adopted one of those war orphans, a young girl, a little girl about three weeks old when she came to live at our house. Wow, what a gift, what a gift from God no, she's been. Uh, but anyway, we continued to, to share the word. God performed miracles. One lady, but uh, people were, you know, they would come the best way they could, but most of them on buses or some from on foot. And we even had some people that came from up near the Honduras border from a place called Please, Honduras, Nicaragua. They came in, in a river raft five days to be on a crusade. But because God was working. Our record attendance there was somewhere around I guess 6,000 was our closest count of them. You know, when you get that many people in the middle of war, I don't know, they can God's going to show up. God's going to show up. He did, Lord, he did. My goodness. But one night, a Jeep pulled in over here to my left-hand side off the platform, clear over by the Shell gas station and parked. After service, we prayed for all the people, but after service, the husband came up and he said, can you come pray for my wife? I said, sure. Went over to the Jeep. There was a lady who was totally paralyzed. She could not turn her head. She could not lift her arm. She could not do anything. She had, we found out later, had been to the United States for all kinds of surgeries and everything. They were wealthy, somewhat wealthy family, enough money at least to do this kind of thing. And nothing worked, nothing worked. Hmm. I don't have time to tell you how they got there. But it was amazing how God even put that together where they knew about the crusade. But anyway, uh, the first night that we prayed, you know, I wish I could tell you that she just instantly jumped up and started running. It didn't happen. Next night they were there. Amen. After it's all over, can you come pray? Yeah, we'll come pray. Six nights that happened. Seventh night when they were getting ready to come to the crusade. They were putting her in the Jeep, strapping her down, putting pillows around her. When someone off to her right called her name. And for the first time in years, I think it was over 15 years, she turned her head to look and see who it was. Two weeks later, she was back in the restaurant they owned working. You see, God does the impossible. Yes, he does. He does. Just keep going. Yes, he does. The first night didn't do it. Do it the second night. Because by simple faith, God said to Satan, mm -hmm. they will overcome you. Amen. Who's Jesus to you? Yes, he will. Mm -hmm. Yes, he will. It works. It works. Yes, 
been so patient and kind. I could go on missionaries to too many stories. <laughs> we love you. We're so glad that you love missions and you have prayed a long, long time. Even when Pastor Tim, uh, Tim's dad was here all of these years, you have been part of us. And we want to say thank you from the depth of our heart for such love and support.